Hello everyone and thank you very much. I'm doubly mic'd here, so there might be kind of Larissa in stereo, which is perhaps never a good idea. Um, thank you so much to, to Liam and to the conference organisers uh, for the invitation to speak at this wonderful conference and to share some of the work that we've been doing thinking about literary knowledge and the making of English teachers. It's been, I've been able to be here for the day today and it's been inspirational, the, the ways in which um, academics and teachers in schools are working together to co-create understandings of what's important and to really wrestle with some of the difficult questions around how are we teaching texts, what kind of texts are we teaching and, and what's the impact of the digital and future English on, um, on Shakespeare particularly. So it, as I said, it gives me great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the project and then I am going to do a bit of a cut of our data that talks about Shakespeare uh, and raise some of the questions for why I think uh, it's important for us to be considering literary knowledge at this time in history. So as Jackie uh, said in her lovely warm introduction, I think Jackie should get the prize for the best kind of introductions for anybody ever. Um, it is terrific. Uh, we were fortunate to receive funding in 2016 for a four-year project looking at um, what might constitute literary knowledge for English teachers. It was a well-funded project and we're really pleased that the humanities and particularly English teaching received this kind of attention from our government. Uh, so that was great. We're particularly interested in the first kind of empirical study of what is the role of literary knowledge. And you might even ask, why are we using those words literary and knowledge together? Why is that important? I'll get to that. We're particularly interested in early career English teachers. So how does their understanding of knowledge change as they move from their first, their second to their third year of teaching? What forces, what institutional forces, what neoliberal forces impact on that understanding of knowledge? And importantly, we're interested in what was the impact of that undergraduate training on you? What was, your, what was the impact of your school understanding of English? And what other forces are at play? So we're interviewing a range of stakeholders, um, professors of literary studies, people running undergraduate degrees, and, and also professional associations. It's a large project, essentially with this longitudinal study. Uh, and, and a big survey as well. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. Just want to um, acknowledge and, and share the team with you. Some of you will know the names on that screen uh, particularly well. I think I've met several people here who have either been taught by Wayne Sawyer, know Wayne Sawyer really well, or who had their thesis examined by Wayne. Um, and and uh, certainly I feel very uh, privileged to be working with this group of scholars who, who span literary studies with Professor Philip Mead from UWA and curriculum, uh, English curriculum with, with Lynn Yates. Uh, so we have a range of people here in Brenton, of course, and, and Wayne and I looking at English education. So why literature, first of all? Now, sitting here at a Shakespeare conference might not be a question we have to actually ask, but it is because it remains the core part of subject English, and there's a lot to say why that's the case, but certainly for us, you'll recall in Australia in 2008, the national curriculum, now called the Australian curriculum, there's a little moment when it was called national, um, reinstated literature as one of the three L's alongside literacy and language. So we were interested to say, well, what is this kind of literary knowledge at this time, in a time when text had become the word we mostly used to talk about English? State accreditation bodies all require teachers who are becoming English teachers to have a big cut of literature there. So that's still considered something that's very important. You can have some creative writing and you can have some linguistics, but if you've got a big chunk of literary study, Terrific, you're right into being an English teacher. Yet, in the tertiary sector, um, what constitutes the literary is constantly changing. So what, what was literature when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I understand in some places is quite different. It includes media, communication, creative writing in ways that were never the case before. Yet our um, accreditation and our institutions say, well, if you've done literary studies, you can become an English teacher. So we were interested at this time, well, what actually constitutes literary knowledge and how are people being prepared to teach English and literature? So why literature, though? Well, of course, we all in different ways, we just had a fantastic talk about empathy or not empathy in literature. Um, it's seen to have special kinds of significances and some, some of these you'll be familiar with. The Glazner, a Glazner American academic talks about it's supposed to be, it's supposed to have special kinds of um, 
measures for public health. I'll leave you to have a look at that. But over time, literature is seen to have certain kinds of affordances. There are imaginative genres. It can be a measure of excellence for work of those genres. Um, it can cause you to um, foster modes of public reflection. So it's given a lot of role in our society, this amorphous group of texts we might call literature. For me, uh, and for some of my work, as, as some of you may know, I've been particularly interested in Australian literatures. So for me, a question around literature is what is the role of national literatures in any kind of knowledge? And how does that intersect, interestingly, with the teaching of Shakespeare, with the teaching of canonical texts and how we might do that? So there's lots of reasons we might talk about English and literature. However, of course, the question of knowledge for English is not straightforward. So just as I indicated, what we have in the tertiary space is um, literature changing and English changing, what that might mean, of course. Subject English, most of, a lot of our time is spent talking about the fact that we can't define it, that it is actually not able to be defined and therefore not easily able to fit into this kind of standard understanding of what might be school knowledge. Uh, so in fact, that creates a really interesting question for us. What is literary knowledge in English when we don't actually necessarily have a clear and fixed or stable view of what English is itself or what knowledge is in English? And this Peter Medway quote is one that I like, kind of is wrestling with what is this notion of knowledge in English? It's a different model for education. In English, knowledge is to be made, not given. It's compromising more than can be discursively stated educational process to be embarked upon with outcomes unpredictable, which like, connects with your, your work on complexity theory, Claire, that we're going to hear about. So this notion that you can't actually define the knowledge, so therefore, what are we doing with our funded project trying to work out what literary knowledge is? There's a social and theoretical and political imperative for English teachers to take up the question of what might be knowledge in English. Some of you may be aware of the work of Michael Young in England and the notion of powerful knowledge which has had a powerful impact on curriculum design. So Michael Young argues that in fact there is important knowledge for school English and it's different to the kind of knowledge you might get from being at home and being with your family and in fact you should be able to define it and that's the job of schooling. And he wants uh, teachers and students and bureaucrats and everybody to be quite clear on that. And so that whole notion of bringing knowledge back into the curriculum as opposed to it being about skills, uh, things that you learn how to do rather than actual sort of forms of content has been really pervasive and in fact is per pervasive in all our curricular documents at the moment. We'll talk about that. Now, Young comes and looks at it from a scientific point of view where it's arguably easier to quantify what might actually, might knowledge might be. Um, but nonetheless, he makes some suggestions for the humanities. So there's a political and social imperative for us to think about that in English. Uh, these are just some snaps from different curricula. Uh, and you'll see that knowledge word is coming up everywhere. This one is, um, is the uh, UK, the, the English curriculum in England. This is the US curriculum. And this is the Australian curriculum. So what, you, what we can see is that notion that there is clear bodies of knowledge and it is being defined. So we're in this political moment, social moment, where knowledge is back into the curriculum. Now, when you talk about knowledge then in England, because it has been, in lots of ways, taken up by arguments from the right of politics saying, well, this is what you actually need to do, and the text should be extremely old, um, and they should be these certain kinds of texts, that in some ways has meant that teachers and those people working with students have not wanted to wade into the knowledge debate. In fact, when I spoke about our project in England, I was warned by a very dear colleague early on, don't talk about knowledge. Don't, don't just, just tone it down a bit on the knowledge issue. And that is because there's great anxiety about what that actually means and who speaks about knowledge. Now, of course, my argument is we actually do need to talk about knowledge and have that question about what we think does constitute knowledge in English and particularly what constitutes literary knowledge, both for our students and because I do think we have view some views on it. By way of example of this, if I put up this sonnet, which was one of my favourite Shakespearean sonnets, <laughs> gave me great hope. <laughs> um, 
thought it was fantastic when I first came across it. If I said to you, what would you want students to know after studying this sonnet, or as they're studying this sonnet, you could probably tell me a range of things. Does anyone want to say? Just have a quick go. What would you want students to know after they'd engaged with this? The genre. The genre. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. One more thing. Yeah. Yeah, the, the conventions around that. So we all, we all could actually identify certain things we would want students to know. And so I guess the argument that we're making in the project is that there's some value in thinking about these things and trying to unpick it and being able to be clear about it, even when there's um, a lot of, there's tension in the space and there's a whole range of things we might make, we might want knowledge to mean. So this is, this is kind of, I guess, the provocation, that it is worth us thinking and leading a question about knowledge as a profession whilst we're acknowledging subjects English history and its complexity. And questions like, well, what is the knowledge base, which is a kind of young argument, and is this term appropriate, or is there another term that's more appropriate when we're thinking about texts and English? And of course, I've already really indicated why. I think it's the contribution we're best placed to make. Um, versions of knowledge are already being mandated through curricula. And we are, in our practices, even just by what we said then, already tacitly saying these are the kinds of knowledges we think are important. And of course, when we're explicit about things, that has really great positive impacts for all pedagogy and for student experiences of texts. So these are our questions then for the study. So that gives you a sense of why we're thinking about it. Claire, just cut me off at any time. And so we're interested in the role of literary knowledge and we're interested, as I said, in those social and institutional contexts and what's going around the teacher to impact on why we, what certain knowledge we think is important. And you might want to reflect to yourself, hmm, what kind of knowledge do I think is important in my teaching when I'm working with students, when I'm taking a text in? What do I want them to know? You know, what do I privilege over other things? Okay, so what are we doing really quickly? We've got this longitudinal study of about 20 early career English teachers across the three states. We've already done a national survey. I'll be really briefly talking about that. Had about over 700 respondents to that, which was fantastic. And we've got our interviews. And then Wayne Sawyer and I, because we just can't get enough of curriculum analysis, we probably get a different kind of hobby, um, are digging right into the Australian curriculum and international curricula and looking at the ways in which knowledge and literature are being evoked, put together, pulled apart in those documents. Uh, and there's more on our, our website if you'd like to find out more about that. So for Shakespeare, then, to bring it to where we are right now. I think it's important for us to ask, when we are committed to the teaching and the study of Shakespeare, as I think we all are here, what does it mean for literary knowledge in Australia? And what does that mean for diverse Australian students? And what are the implications of knowledge debates, debates about powerful knowledge, for your classroom practice, wherever that practice may be? Now, in our survey response, this was one of my the question that we actually raised in one of our, our um, survey questions was, what is the most positive thing that you remember about studying English at school? And this is one of them, so much Shakespeare. It's just, that was the most positive thing. So in our interviews, uh, so we're our interviews of our, our, pre, our early career teachers, taken over now into our third year. We've had 34 interviews, 29 of these, quite unsolicited. So our project's not about Shakespeare, just to be clear. But 29 of these were talking about their teaching in terms of Shakespeare text. There are 148 references to a Shakespeare text in those 29 interviews. So that gives you a sense of how significant this is for early career teachers. The three most often referenced texts, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, and Othello. So perhaps this is not surprising to any of you, but it is interesting when we're asking about teachers' practice and what they think of when they're trying to wrestle with the term literary knowledge, Shakespeare comes up by way of explanation of that kind of term. One of the things that's lovely to do is to kind of give the top 10. So I thought you might be interested in that, well, it's actually the top 13 here. In the survey, so the survey of over 200, um, uh, sorry, over 700 uh, teachers, and not just early career teachers, experienced teachers as well, these are the references. So we see that references up to the 450, nearly 450 around King Leo, and you can see there the texts that are really featuring strongly 
an English teacher's practice. So the, really, the purpose here is, I guess, to say that when we're talking about literary knowledge, we need to be engaging as a team with this notion of what's the role of Shakespeare in this. It's, it's clearly strong for our, for our um, participants. What literary text do you remember studying at school? Okay, for this particular question, we had 428 responses. Only 74 of these people did not list a Shakespeare text. So again, you're getting a sense of what's strong here. Wanted to just talk about uh, what the positive experience really briefly and really give you a little bit of a highlight of those. So of our 519 responses, 62 really talked about Shakespeare. But it's interesting what they said about Shakespeare and what that causes us to think about the ways in which we might understand literary knowledge in English more broadly, not just in terms of Shakespeare. So here's a couple of them. So these are straight from our survey. So this is this idea of what was your most positive experience of literature at school. And I should say one of the reasons we ask this is because there's been a lot of research that, that reminds us that the English teacher is a text in the classroom that you are actually read as much as you are reading texts and that what you bring into the classroom, perhaps unlike a maths teacher, is your textual knowledge. And so it's important to us how English teachers see their own textual knowledge. It's interesting to hear that the most positive thing in the first one was around the creative response to Shakespearean plays. That's the thing, that ability to create. The question that I ask when I read this is, well, what what was the, what's the knowledge aims of these kinds of activities? What are, what are students supposed to know or do or think through these activities? I love this, the second one that underneath that first one, second sentence, doing Shakespeare built up my resilience <laughs> when reading and allowed me to try unfamiliar texts and genres. So what do you need to know? You need to know that you're going to be discombobulated by texts, that you're going to find a way through that. Learning to speak the Shakespearean soliloquy, uh, the, the bottom one in blue, all about uh, bringing al teachers bringing alive Shakespearean text. So we see different things being emphasised and it reminds us of the different ranges of knowledge uh, that are possible here. And just a couple more. Uh, I like the one in blue at the top of the slide. Shakespeare and poetry are my favourites. I found Shakespeare compelling and I seem to decode the language more easily than other students. So that sense of, that, that made me feel good. I kind of had the knowledge beyond others. Um, Reading Shakespeare aloud with peers, discover, uh, discovering the genius of Shakespeare in Europe after having been bored silly by Julius Caesar in year 10. So that sense of well, what, is, what is this formative moment? What does this say about the knowledge that's become important to the teacher or the experience that's been, become important to the teacher? And then how do we understand literary knowledge as a result of that? So just want to finish quickly by saying what have been some emerging themes that have come through the work that we've done so far. Broadly coding, and there's a whole coding matrix using in vivo, I'm very happy to talk to people about that, but a couple of things that we see emerging that are perhaps relevant for this conference and for thinking about those different responses around Shakespeare is that emerging themes regarding what's important or powerful understandings and kinds of knowledge are in the red for students, teachers see it's important that they understand and have a knowledge of the world that is emotional. And this goes to Claire's conversation about how much can actually literature be about teaching empathy. There's a really important um, focus on students having an understanding of their, themselves and developing empathy. So that what, what it is to know literature is to know yourself better and to be able to know other people better. And that's a particular kind of world knowledge that you get from studying literature. The other thing that's emerging is the understanding of the world through language, which is much less emotional and much more sort of technical in some ways. That's an intellectual understanding of language. And it ranges with, of everything from a functional understanding of, you know, you've got to understand these words so you can function in the world. You need to understand how these words work in the world and literature can help you do that. There's an understanding of history and disciplines. So Literature can help you understand history, and that has a particular kind of intellectual role in the world. You can understand other kinds of disciplines, so it's a sort of intellectual understanding of the world. Another thing that we see is this notion of aesthetic, the aesthetic. You can know, you can have an understanding of beauty and truth, 
um, that's, that's quite specific and you can understand how that works within a broader sort of epistemological uh, working of the world. Another aspect that we see is critical literacy and critical thinking coming up as key kind of reasons for um, the kind of knowledge you might be able to develop through literature. So this is still emerging, but there are things that we are seeing, and it's quite interesting how the heart and the head are removed and, and they work together, but sometimes they're quite separate for teachers. So sometimes for teachers it's entirely about the red, and for sometimes it moves between the red and the green. Uh, so yeah, interesting, and I just thought I'd show you a, a little bit about the coding of some of those interviews and the ways in which that's working, so you can have a little look at that. How, in fact, we're working between knowledge that is about language and literature that's moving out and knowledge that's kind of going in. And at the end, you know, what is that metaphor and why do we, why do we need to know about it? So finally, teachers' perspectives and experiences are vital for practice, for knowledge making, for how we understand knowledge in English. And for this conference, I think a question might be, what literary knowledge might Shakespeare stand for, represent, connect with in your 20th century, 21st century national global teaching and research context? What, what is this knowledge standing for, representing in your practice? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.